Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Literacy View. You know, this is our second time with this special guest, and I think that everyone- The second day. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's our second date. That's Thank right, our second date. Same. You didn't change your outfit. We're doing two episodes in one night and you're still in the same outfit, Faith. It's, it's yeah. quite possible. Yes, yes, and I think Steve is too. <laughs> Wait, I think Steve is on the same beach that he was on last time. Yeah, this is this is not a beach. This is a this is a hot spring in uh, Yellowstone National Park. If you if you get in the water, you'll be dead in seconds. Oh. It's that hot. So anyhow, um, you know, we have Steve on for a second time with us, and he was honestly our biggest show out of all the literacy view uno, uno and there's the there's a reason yeah. for that and that's because everyone out there would agree there's nobody better at breaking information down than dr steve dykstra and you know i don't know if any of you have heard of um that podcast with julia lewis dreyfus did you ever hear of it it's called wiser than me it's she's anyhow, she was on Seinfeld, you know, and she has this podcast where she will have these celebrities come on and talk to her. And it's all these women who are at, like at least 75 or older. So they're older than she is. And the show is called Wiser Than Me. And they impart all this knowledge. And I love the podcast. And I couldn't help but thinking about it because um, in my mind, Steve certainly fits the bill as wiser than me. And I love hearing everything he says. I'm sure you would agree. So Dr. Steve Dykstra has worked as a psychologist for over 30 years in the public sector. And he is a founding member of the Wisconsin Reading Coalition and vice president of the Coalition for Reading Excellence. And tonight we are going to talk about something that recently came out and it was Dr. Mark Seidenberg's slide deck that he posted on his own website, um, markseidenberg.net. And uh, he put it out there, of course, to be helpful. And yet, a lot of people on social media are buzzing about it. And I just, you know, would like to start off by asking Steve what his first thoughts were when he saw this slide deck. By the way, um, Mark Seidenberg is from the University of Wisconsin. Steve is from Wisconsin. So I, you know, we both find that very interesting. Um, or at so, some point, cheese will enter the conversation. You know. <laughs> oh my God, that's funny. So, if you could just um, tell us your first impressions after well, looking at the slide deck. Let me what start with this. Let me start with a small disclaimer. I know Mark. I consider Mark a friend of mine. I have great respect for Mark. I've appeared and spoken in his classes on several occasions. Um, we have some other connections to each other. I've sat next to him in on panels that are speaking. Uh, on behalf of the state of Wisconsin and in the legislature and that kind of stuff. That is not to say that I reflexively agree with everything he says. I disagree with some of his things. He disagrees with some of my things. We're very respectful about that. Um, my first thought when I go to read things, you know, I, this was sent to me by some other people and then you brought my attention to it. It took me a little while to get to it, um, a few days. And, you know, I was kind of ready for something, oh my God, you know, what am I going to see in there? Because I, I knew people who were kind of gnashing their teeth and, you know, sort of rolling around in the ground, moaning uncontrollably uh, because it's somewhat's in here. So I was sort of looking for that. I didn't find anything like that. It's it's not that I just, it's not that I completely agreed with everything he said, or I would emphasize the things he emphasizes, but I didn't think there was anything quite catastrophic here. Um, I'm, you know, I was a little, I was a little, sad that he singled out this woman from TikTok and sort of drew attention to her in a negative way. I'm not saying his criticism is incorrect, but I, I'm a little reluctant with the, that happening to somebody who's just trying to do the best she can um, and is not an academic, isn't you know a scientist or anything like that. So I, I, I kind of wish those things didn't happen, but you know, 
so what? Um, you know, what Mark is saying in this presentation, it, you know, from a high level, I think we really kind of in a broad level, we really can't disagree with. He's saying we have to be cautious. We have to recognize as our attention kind of needs to shift away from what they got wrong to what we might be getting wrong. Um, that's a big shift for some people. That's a big shift for me. You know, I've been kind of a firebrand and a sword, wielding a sword against whole language and balanced literacy for 15 years, 20 years. And, you know, I've made a very conscious effort recently to say, I'm gonna, I'd am i rather talk about the stuff where we're kind of stepping off the path and be getting things wrong um, and not worry about them getting any so so much, the other guys about getting it wrong anymore. I think those days are past. I think we are. We are in the ascendancy. We're taking the reins in a lot of places. I don't think that's going to stop. Um, I think, you know, I would word it differently than some of what Mark says. I think people, I think a lot of people, I think I do this. I think everybody does this. We're confusing um, our favorite interpretation of the science with the science itself, you know, and people know that the science says we have to teach phonemic awareness and we need to teach phonics and we need to teach a lot of different things. That science is well known. There's some more science about how we do things. But there's a lot of people out there who are sure that their way of doing it, because they had the science at heart when they did it, is absolutely mandated. You have to do it this way. If you're not doing it this way, um, things, this is bad. I think one of the examples of that is Orton Gillingham. I think people, there's a lot of people out there who are consistent that if it's not OG, it's not the science of reading. And if you're not doing everything they do in OG, um, kids are going to die in the hallways and not make it home after school. And, you know, they're terrible, horrible things are going to happen. They're all going to end up in prison. Um, and, you know, that's just not true. Uh, we need to be more open about that. I think Mark is stepping in and telling people something that's hard to hear. And that is the science is only telling you so much. You need to know what the science says. You need to know where the edge of the science is. And you need to know that, that a lot of what you do may already not be as perfect as you think it is. And certainly some of what you do is gonna be found, is gonna be improved on in the coming months, years, and decades. And are you ready to change when that happens? Because I think a lot of people aren't. So Judy, um, from a teacher perspective, you um, were not so pleased with this slide deck. And by the way, I don't think I said the name of it. Sorry, I'm a little tired. I just got home from a long flight only at five o'clock and we're doing this at seven o'clock. So <laughs> um, where does the science of reading go from here? That was the name of the presentation and it was given at the Yale Child Center on December 4th. I think so it's important for people to know that this is the phrase science of reading is in, has quotation marks around it. And I think that's very intentional. And Mark is saying, where does this thing we call the science of reading go from here? Because part of it, parts of it are not as much science as other parts are science. This is, you know, the science of reading is a little bit like somebody saying, I'm going to serve you a healthy meal. And you look in this part of the plate, there's a really healthy food. And over here, there's a healthy food. Up here, there's a s'more you know, over here, there's maybe a little bit of marshmallow fluff and you start saying, well, some of this is healthy food and maybe some of it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to be willing to, to not throw the whole plate out, um, but at the same time, not say everything on the plate is good for us. So Judy, what are your thoughts? You looked over the slide deck and um, I'd love to hear from you. So I have to be honest, like, First, I was nervous to read it because I saw so much buzz online and um, people got very emotional about it. So I finally gave it a chance and it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I think presentation is everything. Mm -hmm. And just throwing a slide deck on there with like red writing and black writing. And it, it was just, I didn't know if I should take it seriously. And, and you know, words also have meaning. And I know that you know, one of the words was that, you know, um, it said not an experiment. And like to even like associate what's happening right now and use the word experiment, whether it's sarcastic or not, made me really kind of uncomfortable because I think 
you know, everybody's in a different place on their journey, right? I'm seven years into my structured literacy journey. Some people are just starting out. Some schools have shifted dramatically. Some schools still have sprinkles of F and P and foundations. And, you know, everybody's in a different place. And, you know, just putting out this information, kind of like talking about, you know, the flaws when people are right now making shifts, we've been talking about the flaws for a while, but we talk about it, you know, in relation to an article or something. And I felt like here's his little slide deck and here it is with all this information with graphics. And it just felt like the tone was like, kind of like, kind of like. Condescending, insulting. I don't know if it was condescending, but kind of like, I feel like people really are trying to make shifts right now. And I right. think that it's a critical time when people are trying to, you know, sort through the muddy waters. And this is not very helpful. Well, that's so why I miss solutions. And I'm a very solution based person. And it's very easy to say, you know, oh, this is imperfect. And this experiment and it, the answer is still up in the air and using words like that. Mm -hmm. I felt well, people in their journey. Here's how I felt. I I saw what he was trying to say, right. and I could agree with a lot of what he was trying to say in the message. But I did feel by putting the slide deck up without context yeah. and without a nuanced discussion about it, it offended people, and I could see. Why? Um, Steve, your the thoughts on that? Just people from people a teacher people. perspective, yeah. Yeah. what would you... Uh, Young people were dancing up for joy today online. I'm sorry, did you a say... A lot of balanced literacy people were rejoicing today. And, I, you know, it was yeah. just a weird day. You know, because, you know, the, the problem with the remnant of balanced literacy and whole language and the people who really continue to defend that, people like, you know, Sam Bomarito, who, you know, just, I think, I, I wonder sometimes if he got kicked in the head when he was a kid. Um, you know, the the problem with that is they, that whole movement is so untethered from truth that they are free to work very, very quickly when they see stuff like this or other statements out there. They, they can jump all over it because they are not burdened by facts and reality. So they can spin this any way they want. Everybody else, it slows us down because we have to stop and think about this. And what, if there's a problem here, is it real? What is it? You start thinking about different things. So we're all sort of, you know, sort of kvetching and stroking our chin whiskers while balanced literacy people are just running all over the place and, you know, putting it up, like putting posters on the wall, you know. And people sometimes get frustrated with Mark because he, he said things before that that crowd harvest kind of dishonestly because they don't understand what he meant and if they do if they do understand what he meant they don't care um but i i'm this isn't one of the times that i would blame mark for that or pull him aside i mean some of this is just going to happen this is what happens with science i mean so to so a metaphor to address what you're experiencing um i don't remember what it was but the first time the space shuttle flew we were all you know, the world was really odd. This is this is an amazing thing. And it comes back and they land it like a plane. And oh, isn't this incredible? This is like cutting edge technology. By the time they got it onto the runway, by the time they launched it from a from a pad, it was so far from cutting edge technology because it took that long to build it. By the time it could fly, by the time it could fly, it was like three generations removed from the cutting edge technology because it took that long to get it there. And I, the reason I use that metaphor is I want teachers to understand you are not responsible to be out on the cutting edge of the science to incorporate all that. That will happen in time. It will filter down to you. You know, you can fly the space shuttle and feel good about it. You don't have to wait until they come out with a super duper, even better space shuttle, you know, 20 years later, which, you know, we still haven't done. Um but I think it is important for people to know that what they're doing is is not it's not out on the bleeding edge of technology. It's not out on the bleeding edge of the science, and that's okay. 
but they should they should also not think this is the best. The question, my questions are all answered. This is the best thing you can do. And there will never be something better than this. I think that's something that people have to be cautious about. And I know that Mark is very concerned that people are throwing around the term the, the science of reading. I'm less concerned about this, but I understand where he comes from. They're throwing around the term science of reading and they falsely imagine that because it's been labeled that way, that it is fixed and unchanging. Like we've we've done it, we've got the best thing possible. There's nothing, there's never gonna be anything better than this. You know, I've reached the pinnacle. Um, and, it, you know, clearly that's not true. And it's kind of threatening to say that to people. And it can come off as kind of rude and condescending. People can feel like, you know, you're you're sort of making fun at me, you know, fun of people can feel bad about those things. Yeah, well, I could tell you that um, there are a lot of people on social media talking about this. As you said, um, the last time Mark spoke about phonemic awareness, there was a lot of controversy about that, even though um, you know he was right about the science not showing this advanced proficiency as far as there being um, evidence behind that part, at least the term of yeah. advanced proficiency. Yet we know it's important for phonemic awareness to develop. So, you know, I guess my concern is for teachers, Steve. Like, yeah. you, know, you hear these things, I think it's very confusing because they are waiting for somebody like, Dr. Mark Seidenberg to kind of shine the light on, well, what do we do? And he has said before, well, he's a researcher, he's not a practitioner. But then the message really leads people down this path of, you know, just trying to do the best that they can. And yeah. maybe it isn't tied to the science, but it's informed by the science. Yes. And those are two different things, right? Yeah. So the other thing that I think we have to that? keep in mind is is Mark, you know, there are scientists who exist at sort of different levels of what's going on. There's some scientists over the years, um, Jack Fletcher, Joe Torgerson, who, who do have done some very good science, but the science they're doing is closer to the classroom. Um, it's easier to translate into the classroom. They have the classroom in mind when they're doing their science. They're choosing some areas for scientific inquiry because they're actually thinking this, answering this question would be good for teachers. It's, it would be good for us to do it. Mark is not that kind of a scientist. Wow. He's back at the very basic science. He's looking at computer, you know, uh, advanced computer models of how reading occurs in the brain. He's tweaking variables. I had a professor in graduate school, Dennis Mulfees, who does really super basic, uh, really earth shattering research about how brains of infants process sound and how you can see the markers of dyslexia when kids are only a few weeks old. Um, that's a very different kind of science than what Jack or Joe or uh, Hugh Katz, um, Julie Washington, uh, sometimes Marianne Wolf are doing, keeping things closer to the classroom, although Marianne does some really super cutting edge neuroscience as well. Um, and that's a different thing. That's a different thing to interpret. It, it can be a little more intimidating. And at the level of science that Mark is doing, the, the part of the science that Mark is doing, his research is not designed to tell us what to do. It's designed to tell us what not to do. Mm, that's, that's pretty powerful. Ooh, science can't dead. really tell you what to do. Dead. The thing to do from in that in that kind of science, you have to understand, the thing you end up doing is the part of teaching kids to read that Mark science hasn't killed off yet. You know, it, it, it's, the, it's the idea that survives. All of science, really hard, pure science, says, I have this idea, I have this hypothesis, and I'm going to see if I can prove it wrong. And the only, it's, you know, you never prove it right, you just fail to prove it wrong. That is a brutal thing. That is a really brutal kind of science and you know it it inspires inspires a certain kind of person. I remember when they turned on 
this big superconducting super collider in England, in in Europe, the, the Large Hadron Collider, and they were going to look for the Bose um, the Bose particle, the the what's been sometimes called the the God particle. And I saw an interview with one of these scientists, and these are really hardcore, just you know, in the detail scientists. And this guy was asked by this reporter. What would be the most exciting thing to have happen? He said, the most exciting thing would be if the first flood of data showed that everything we think we believe is wrong. And the, the reporter didn't know what to say because how could you what how could you say as a scientist it would be so cool to find out that what I've believed for the last 30 years is all wrong? You know, but that's the kind of science that Mark does. That's the kind of sort of let's see if I can crush this idea. Oh, I can't. Oh, that's interesting. Um I beat it with the scientific hammer and it's still there. That's pretty cool. That's a very different kind of science than what we imagine from the classroom or from the office or for, you know, people who are out there as practitioners. And sometimes connecting those two ends of the spectrum is very difficult to do. Um, so I want people to not feel like Mark is trying to come and take their blanket away from them or, or leave them I out in the like cold. I feel like without my blanket today if I have to really be kind of honest. Yeah, yeah. I feel like, you know, some of the things kind of were negating things that I learned in letters about how the brain works. I feel like a lot of the stuff that I learned about ENL learners, I think he mentioned that they don't need phonics. Did I misunderstand? It's, it's you know, if you're learning a second language, you already have a lot of wiring in your head. Right for phonics because you if you speak spanish you've got some wearing in your head for phonics your brain but is everybody's proficiency steve is different right so done this once before and it's not that they don't need phonics it's right it, it's right but we shouldn't think that they're going to need the same level you know somebody who's mastered the phonics and the phonology of spanish it's just going to have to kind of reorder those things a little bit which can be easier for some people and harder for others to accomplish the same things in English. It's not the same thing. We should, we don't have to expect that we're going to laboriously teach these letters sound, these graphing phoning correspondences right. over the same period of time. That They're going to figure some but things I think out. That, you know, he just put it as a statement and, and that might make yeah. sense to you. And I know for me, it didn't fully make sense because I know that, you know, kids have different proficiency levels. We have kids that are in, you know, classrooms and they don't speak much Spanish or they can't yeah. comprehend the Spanish. So I think it really depends. And then something like that, somebody could walk away. Oh, maybe foundations or, you know, the phonics is not that important. And that's, you know, it's a slippery slope when you just put out a PowerPoint and people are, you know, teachers are just trying to make it through the day and looking at these words and seeing things like, oh, these laws needed to change. It was a necessary evil. It's just not a very optimistic kind of way to approach the work we have ahead of us, which is already so, you know, difficult and so challenging for so many people. I don't know. Yeah. I, and I was having a bad day. I don't know. It's. I, th I think he, getting that feedback from people and getting that feedback from teachers, getting that feedback from people who are closer to closer to the classroom is important. Um, but you know, so I picked up. I'll tell you. Let me tell you. So I, without going into too many details, I picked up a prescription for a medical condition that I have uh, some a couple of years ago, and as I picked up the prescription at Walgreens go over to the little window and have your consult with the with the uh, pharmacist. And he started to hand me the bag and he didn't let go of it. And I had a hold of it. And it's got that information sheet stapled to it. He said, have you taken this before? And I said, no. And he looked me in the eyes and he said, there's a lot of information in there about what this can do to you. He said, don't read it. <laughs> he said, because that's people who are taking a much higher dose and are taking it for 30 years. Don't read it because it'll that was really nice he the said you won't day. sleep tonight. Wow. Um, and, you know, I knew all that stuff already and it didn't bother me and I understood the limitations. But I so appreciated what he was saying and recognized how important that was to other people. You know, I think if people want to read Mark's stuff to understand it, because it gives them a window into something else and it takes their knowledge kind of to a new level, I think that's fine. If you're reading Mark's stuff because you're trying to figure out what I should be doing in my lesson tomorrow, you're reading the wrong stuff. 
That is such a good point. And you know, and I think Mark would agree with me on that. I think he would. He is abs. He would be the first to say, "Oh God, yeah." You know, if he thought people were picking up this thing and saying, "Now, how should I teach phoneme awareness after the holidays?" You know, it, he'd be like, "God, no! That you know, that's not what it's oh, for." Who would this, so, so I learned from Karen Harris. Uh, we we write to inform, to entertain, and to persuade. Who was Mark trying to inform? Yeah, what? Who's the audience for this? I think that is a very good question because I, when you put up a PowerPoint, yeah, many times it's teachers who are looking at this. Right. So, it, you know, who's your audience? And if that was the intended audience, then I think it needed a lot more context and. Yeah something around this because otherwise it's going to be misinterpreted as judy said you know the enl piece i know what you're saying steve you can't treat um, a struggling reader the same way as you treat an enl child because yeah. maybe they have um literacy maybe. in their own language maybe. you know right. maybe maybe and that's yeah. correct yeah that's a good point you know yeah. we, we see these kids who speak Spanish fluently and they're trying to learn to read and write and speak English. And we're making, what if they speak Spanish beautifully, but they can't read it or write it to save their life. I mean, you need exactly. to know that. You need right. to know that before they step into it. And the right. other thing you run into when you're dealing, you know, I'll use Spanish again as an example. There are levels of reading difficulty, which would not hamper you to speak, to learn to read and write Spanish because Spanish is, relatively speaking, a very transparent orthography compared to English, which is a very opaque orthography. So you could have a level of disability, you know, that, this, this thing we call dyslexia, you could have a level of disability, which really isn't harming you very much when you speak, when you read and write Spanish, which could suddenly become a problem when you read and write English. And so that becomes a very complicated question. You know, Steve, it's so interesting. Um, you know, I know kids who, um, you know, have to practice for their bar or bat mitzvahs yes. and they have to read in Hebrew. Right. So they write Mark to read in faith. They, they read it in English and it sounded like they were reading in Hebrew, but they didn't master it. Well, the, what I was saying is sometimes those kids are able to read in yes. Hebrew because they're taught with, yeah. you know, exact explicit instruction in um this the symbols and um and then in english because they're taught maybe through a balanced literacy approach they struggle there but they didn't struggle when they have to read in hebrew which is quite interesting so what yeah, and, um you know, you know trans interestingly enough mark you know who, who has been bar mitzvah um it comments on that saying um, and I don't know how much this is true, and you'll, you're you going to know more about this than me, that if you got to learn a language like that, Hebrew is pretty good. It's a pretty transparent orthography. You know, it, it's, it's relatively predictable. It's not that hard to read. And you can end up much like I am with Spanish. I can read and pronounce Spanish quite well. I have no idea what any of those words mean, right. um, except maybe two or three of them. But I can read it pretty well. And I... I think your point is well taken that you you know kids could do that with Hebrew, particularly when they get their Torah passage and you know they can learn the meaning of it kind of simultaneously. It doesn't mean they could go read. They may be able to decode something else into sound from someplace else in the Torah, but they may not know what it means because learning to comprehend a language is a much deeper problem than learning to pronounce it. Yes. So Judy, in the article, uh, it says here identifying what was wrong was much easier than figuring out what to do instead. It's absolutely true. Yes. So, okay, absolutely true. But then it's a statement. How, how do you feel about that as a teacher hearing that? I agree with that. But as a teacher, again, we have to take what Steve said that it's not really meant to pick up the PowerPoint and say, okay, now this is going to be something practical for a teacher. Where does that leave you as a coach looking at this? And how do you feel about that? I think, um, you know, I'm gonna say it 
the F word, frustrated. <laughs> frustrated. I heard skip the beat there for a today moment. Today the too. word is not fidelity. <laughs> today the word is frustrated. You know, I see teachers, their faces are tired. They're overwhelmed. They're thinking how to, you know, structure their literacy blocks so that all the key, key components of structured literacy is happening. Um, you know, kids are making gains, but it's not easy when you have to start making sure that the application piece happens as well, because things taught in isolation don't automatically, through the power of osmosis, happen when a kid is reading, you know, either a decodable text or some type of text. So I think the key is frustration. And then when there are statements thrown out there, um, I don't remember them verbatim, but it was something like, um, you know, you'll see a lot of these things posted on Twitter, like structured literacy won't hurt anybody. And of course it won't hurt anybody. But basically, I think in this PowerPoint, it basically said, uh, that's not the best statement because it was probably implying that that might not be the best use of everybody's time. We get it. But right now we've seen such a gap for such a long time right. in terms of literacy scores. I mean, I've been in the school system now since I started teaching in 2000 and the literacy scores have been abysmal for a very large percentage of students. Is it the best course of action to right now talk about how it might not be the best use of time for some students? We know that. We know that some students need to be challenged and so forth. A right. good teacher always knows that. Right. But I think that this article could potentially derail efforts. And I think right now we have to, A, think about solutions. B, we have to realize teachers are frustrated. We have to realize coaches are frustrated, right? We, we're the change agents, but it's not that easy to make shifts happen. They don't happen overnight, right? This right. year, you might have prioritized this. Next year, you might prioritize this. Um, you know, there's still the COVID kids. Some people like to use COVID, some people don't. But change takes time. And I think what this PowerPoint, which I still don't know who the target audience was for, or if it was just like, it kind of looked weird. It almost felt like I was reading somebody's diary or something of their inner thoughts, the way it was presented. And it just, it kind of looked like, in all fairness, he did present this to a group. You know, this was just, he was sharing his PowerPoint, but he was presenting he was a lot different from just showing a PowerPoint. I don't know. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. You know, I, I think one of the part things of our show has been reading articles, right, Faith? All we do is read articles, and this looked very different. It felt very but, Well, it wasn't yeah. an article. It, it, it wasn't it, an article. It wasn't an article, which is why I'm wondering about putting it up. How was it, how was it supposed to be used, Steve? Like, so, okay, so let's say you're saying, um, you know, it, it's not really for a teacher to take it and run with it. Then how, what's the best use of this PowerPoint? Is it just to disseminate information about the science of reading? I mean, your thoughts on that? I think it's I think it's to put some of what we do in perspective, and that's hard to do. I think I I imagine that if Mark were here right now, he would agree vigorously with the thing I'm about to say. And I think this is part of his purpose. And that is people are under the misimpression that because this is the science of reading, that oh, I'm gonna hang with the scientific people now because they have all the answers. And Mark is saying, we don't have all the answers. And some of the things you may think are answers are going to turn out to be wrong. And like Judy's saying, that feels to a lot of people like we're pulling the rug out from under them. You promised me science, science equals answers. Now you're telling me you don't have answers. What's going on? You know, I feel like I'm being, you feel a little bit like you're being lied to. Um, or sold that, another story. Right. Well, <laughs> you know, so I'll, I'll share a little bit too. So I am. Um, um, I belong to a Protestant church, a mainline Protestant church, where I'm very involved with people who abide what we refer to and discuss and consider something that's known popularly as progressive Christianity, which is a very different approach to the Bible and biblical interpretation and all that kind of stuff than what you would see in kind of conservative evangelical Christianity. Um, and we spend a lot of time talking about questions and at the end going, I don't know, nobody knows. 
there's like five or six ordained ministers in the group. They're retired ordained ministers. There's a retired ordained bishop. And we're all standing around going, yeah, I don't know. Um, and that shakes a lot of people up. That that approach is not for everybody because it is comforting to have answers. We want answers. We are comforted by answers. And what people like David Kilpatrick and Louisa Motes do for people is they help form these things into answers. Um, and that kind of necessarily leads people to believe that we're that we've got these answers worked out a little more than they actually are. Mark stands at on a, in a different area and he looks at that and he sometimes objects. I think sometimes he objects to it a little clumsily and more harshly than he needs to. And unfortunately that can be easily understood, but that's for, that's a different conversation. Um, I actually think it's for this conversation, Steve, I'll tell uh, you why, because I'm going to be very honest. Um, you know, I have both of Dr. Kil Kilpatrick's books. I've done the assessments. I, I, understand the importance of phonemic awareness but you know when i read that i thought it was truly settled science in right. terms of what that advanced proficiency level is and i know i'm not alone in that and a lot of school districts bought hegarty as like the answer I mean you know right. that they worked on this phonemic awareness piece and tons of money was spent on that only to find out later that there was not real proven evidence. It doesn't mean it doesn't help. Right. It doesn't right. mean that there's not room to find out about it, but it gave the impression that it was like a settled science that, you know, doing right. this separate and apart from other things, that that was the answer. So right. I understand. Hegarty did shift though, Faith. They, once the research did come out and it was clarified this year, schools are using a newer version of Hegarty where they're focusing more on the strands that do align. But you're 100% right, Faith. When, every, when Hegarty just hit the market, everybody was like, this is a must. Meanwhile, you I called the company once and said, is there data? Is there a data tracking sheet? How much data is there behind it? They said, we're working on it. So, you know, I, I think when it comes, to, you know, to district spending money, yeah, they are not just going to go to one of your meetings, Steve, and just shrug their shoulders and say, I don't know. <laughs> they're going to try to trust and they're going to spend money on something. They, you know, school district leaders are looking for answers. It's not just teachers. These people are charged with buying materials and programs and yeah. they don't want just a maybe, you know? And I think the balanced literacy proponents, as Judy um, said, they might be, you know, misinterpreting what Steve is saying too, because we all see things through the lens that we want to see it through, you know? Um, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, your thoughts. It's, so I'm going to use some fancy words and the, the word heuristic can be used to mean a number of different things and you have to be, pay attention. I'm using the word heuristic in this case to describe the idea of an approximation of a thing that's true that we know is not correct, but it's a it's approximate enough that it's useful. It's mm -hmm. useful to us, and getting it and making it more precise would would take so much energy right now that it's not worth doing. We've got a good enough approximation. We know that in time, eventually, we're going to get to a different answer. The other thing I want to tell you is, so I work with. Um, in my clinical work, I work with a lot of kids in, in I'm the clinical director of a program in Milwaukee County that identifies young people, usually adolescents, in the earliest stages of psychosis like schizophrenia and in the earliest stages of what we call clinical high risk for schizophrenia. I don't have to get into what all that means, but most of these kids take medications and almost all the medications they take, all antipsychotic medications we know that are effective, at least part of what they do is decrease the availability of dopamine in parts of their brain. So you might conclude from that that schizophrenia is caused by too much dopamine in certain parts of your brain. No, that's absolutely not true. We know that's not true. But the best treatments we have 
all reduced dopamine in parts of your brain. Someday, if we figure out at a deeper level what this is, we may find a treatment that more accurately targets the actual cause of this illness or maybe prevents it from happening before it occurs that may have nothing to do with dopamine. Um, our best answer is probably going to be something entirely separate from dopamine. I also have a cousin who is one of the leading cancer researchers in the world. And I haven't talked to him in a long time, but the last time I talked to him about this, he said, you know, the cure, when we figure out how to cure cancer at some point in the future, it's not going to look anything like what we do now. We know that we absolutely know that the best treatments for cancer will eventually look nothing like what we have now. But right now, what we have, is what we have. It's what we need. Um, and, you know, when when somebody turns to a doctor and they're starting out in chemotherapy and somebody says, is this it? Is this what's going to cure me? That's a really hard question for doctors to answer because they know maybe not, but this is the best thing we have right now. Um, and people need confidence and teachers need confidence and teachers need to not dwell or be distracted by people who are saying, you know, this isn't really the best way to do it. It's a, it's a good enough way. It's a valid heuristic. We can improve on it later, but right now we got to go with what we have. That's an interesting point. Um, Judy, you know, it, it's, it's funny. We, when we're in schools and if we were to say, well, this is the best that we know right now, um, you know, I could see, at least from my experience, People saying, but from my experience, what we were doing was the best thing that I um, knew. And I think Steve understands where I'm, I'm coming from. You, you understand like that there are going to be people who will argue that point and say, well, if it's not right now proven, you know, that this is it, I could say from my experience, that's the best that we knew. What do you think, Judy, just from, you know, working in schools? What are your thoughts on that? So I think I, I think it's a slippery slope and that we have to be very careful. Like even in looking at literacy blocks, recently um, somebody I was talking to at a different site was like, oh, maybe we should cut the phonics portion of the literacy block. And I'm like, no, that's not the portion that you cut when you're trying to teach kids how to read. I think that we have to be really, really mindful of, you know, looking at our data. What is our data telling us? And, you know, keeping that in mind. And I just feel like when I looked at this PowerPoint and I know I keep going back to it, you it should. felt very divisive. And I think just like our political state, and you know, I don't really talk politics on the show, but just like, you know, in politics, the world is so divided. I felt like this might reignite the literacy wars rather than moving the work forward. You know, I think I, those of us on the science side of the fence have watched from a distance for a while now as people who are very dedicated to whole language and balanced literacy had their you know, use a very Protestant phrase, have their come to Jesus moment and realize that, oh my Lord, this isn't what I thought it was. And that for some of them, that's very, a very painful and difficult experience. And I have a lot of respect for the people who've put themselves through that and faced that. I think that's, that is a thing that most hey, professionals and most that was my life. never I've do. Former reading yeah. recovery person. So right, right. So that's a that challenging thing. They come across the fence to the science of reading and they and we sort of, um, let out a heavy sigh and go, well, I'm glad that's over. That's never going to happen to me again. And the fact is, it is going to happen to you again. Because if, if you know, if your mistress is science, that's going to happen to you. Um, right. That stuff's going to happen. And that's not a happy feeling for people. You know, it's like, oh, my God, I might go through this another time or two or three in the course of my career. I didn't want that. That's a um, very interesting point. You know, what, what balanced literacy and whole language were selling people was certainty. You know, one of the things they were telling people was... <laughs> You know, teachers would go and ask, what do I do? And professors and trainers would say, when the moment arrives, you'll just know what to do. Yeah. You know, you'll, you'll just through all your experience, 
And that's a really comforting thing until you get to that moment. And you realize I really have no idea what to do. Oh my God. You know, everybody else knows what to do. Everybody, but me. And, you know, you get it, you get people into a room and they go to letters training and get them into a room. And the first person talks about, I felt like I was a fake all those years. And everybody starts to cry. Cause they're like, you know, me too, me too, me too. Um, I think some really important things to understand you know, we talk about teaching phonics, really important thing. We talk about teaching ph ph phonological awareness and phonemic awareness, really important thing. We're talking more and more about teaching morphological awareness, I think also a very important thing. But let me, and I'm, I may get the statistics a little bit wrong. There are over 200 phoneme grapheme correspondences in the English language, and the rules behind them are exceptionally complex. Some of them, some of them are much more straightforward. We do not teach all of those. There is no curriculum out there that teaches all of those. We teach certain ones. We teach certain high value ones. And whether we're aware of it or not, we're relying on these kids to divine the other ones kind of inferentially. Now, you know, we're trying to get away from a way of teaching kids, which relies on that sort of statistical inferential learning for everything. And the impression people have is we aren't going to rely on it at all. Oh, hell, we're going to rely on it a little less than they did. But we can't teach all of those. And there's no evidence that somebody who needs us to teach all of those is then going to be able to read. If your brain is wired up in such a way that's really that bad at statistical learning and that struggles that much with the inferential learning of these materials, you're probably not going to ever be a skilled reader. It's just it's just not practical. This, you know, phonological awareness and phonemic awareness. You know, one of the things I say about phonemic awareness, people talk about explicitly teaching phonemic awareness. My point, my position is nobody's ever explicitly taught phonemic awareness because it's an awareness. It's not, it's not a specific do this, do this. We're we're leading the horses to the water. We're leading these kids up to these, we're giving them experiences that we think make phonemic awareness more apparent and easier for them to take the leap and go, oh, I get it and for the light to go on. But teaching a kid how to move their mouth and how to make a sound and saying, don't you hear the difference between those two sounds? That's not the same as teaching somebody that one plus one is two. I can explicitly teach addition. I don't think you can explicitly teach phonemic awareness. You can specific, specifically and intentionally put kids in a position where they very deliberately are given the opportunity, the better opportunity to recognize the phonemes, but I don't think you can, can teach them to be aware and recognize the phonemes. So that's a thing we have to face. And morphological awareness, I think we just teach etymology and morphological awareness. And if you think you're gonna teach all of it, you are nuts because there is so much there. You really just need to get these kids to realize that it's going on. You need to get them, their brains recognizing that it's happening because you can't teach all of that. You can't. Um, you know, but I think you do, we, but you do have to. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. But, but you do have to help kids who are struggling yes. to differentiate between different sounds. Yes. And if you look at that PowerPoint, it doesn't come across with that explanation. No. And that is a problem. People and I think the I think the word I think the word he used talking about sort of the cult of phonemic awareness and the fetish of phonemic, I think it was the fetish of phonemic awareness is, a, I think it's a very powerful word. I think I think I, I understand pretty well what he's getting at. We certainly have people out there who think that every problem with a kid in early reading can be solved by teaching more and more and more phonemic awareness, um, that it's the solution to every problem, um, kind of like some sort of cream that somebody sold in patent medicine cream or snake oil that somebody sold in the early 20th century. What do you got? It'll cure that, you know? Um, and I think that language is a little unfor unfortunate, but I think the point is well taken that we, we can't have our thing that we cling to so tightly that we think solves everything. There isn't anything that solves everything. And- um, That makes sense. What about, why didn't he put like research studies like link research studies to like every point, like like some of the points right here. Emphasis on print, simple view of reading. I, I think it says something, but it says, but language has the biggest impact. And then it just says Scarsboro, Scarsboro. Most reading problems aren't about print. So it's like these broad statements 
another one, implicit versus, um, but implicit learning, most of, most of knowledge that supports reading isn't learned via explicit instruction. Now, explicit instruction, that term is the biggest term right now that I'm hearing in education. And it just said, most of knowledge that supports reading isn't learned via explicit instruction. So I'm like, OMG. Like I would make, I, I think that's absolutely correct. It's, a, it's another way of saying what I said just prior to, to just a little while ago. If I was doing a presentation like this, I would spend the entire hour just talking about that. I, th I think that's something that deserves an hour of time all on its own. And as you say that, I have an invitation from one of the major conferences to come next year and talk about whatever I want to talk about, and um, which is very generous of them. And I think I'm going to talk about that. Um, Implicit I, versus explicit instruction? Just, you know, because it is disturbing to people to realize that even when we do the science of reading, most of what kids learn about reading and how to read, the vast majority of it will be inquired statistically or inferentially. That's how it's going to happen. And the best right, example of that, and he has it in here. The thing that administrators right now, one of the biggest things they're looking for is the I do, we do, and you do in those classrooms. Right. But one of the most important things that reading and language instruction do for us, one of the most important things we have to do is acquire as much vocabulary as possible that we understand and can use. Right. And if you have 30, 40, 50,000 words in your vocabulary, how many of those were taught to you explicitly? That's true. I mean, that's the best example. Now, that's alarming. That's alarming to people. And I understand why it's alarming, because on one end, we're saying explicit instruction is structured literacy is absolutely essential. And then we're saying, but most of what the kids learn, they're just going to pick up as they go. Right, um, exactly. And that's really, really tough for people. Um and I understand why. Which I understand means know why. your audience. Know your audience. It's not tough for somebody like you, Steve, who lives in right. this work, but for yeah. somebody like me or somebody who just started teaching yesterday or in September, that might be very different. So right, it it's, right, absolutely. I think that's important. And maybe things like this need to come with kind of a caution, like a, 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 a beware. A Surgeon General's warning, you know, before you uh, before you go in here, you know, be aware of this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't, you know, don't think that it says this. Um, I think that could could be very valuable uh, to some people. But the other thing that's happening is we're asking, you know, if Mark gave a presentation, I've seen this happen when he when he presents. People say, "What's the study that shows this? What's the three studies that show this? What are the best studies that show this?" and that happens to me too. My most popular presentation that I give right now in different places around the country, I'm talking about what kids need, what brains need for kids to develop and be successful. One of them is language, which includes reading and writing. One of them is safety, which includes feeling safe in a world that has existential threats. And one of them is relationships, which is come, which is very uh, problematic for kids in the age of social media, when you can have a relationship with somebody you've never actually met. Um, and that can be confusing to our brains. And so I talk about those things in very kind of emotional pointed ways. And there's a lot of crying usually, and people come and talk to me afterwards. What's the study that shows this? And I said, well, this is something that coalesces, that sort of comes into focus. If you read a few hundred really good studies and reviews about child development, and if you read about neurology, there isn't one study that shows this. There isn't a collection of 20 studies that show this. This is the nexus of some very large bodies of research and theory and thoughts and commentaries and philosophies about child development. And, you know, I, I think, you know, when people come to Mark or so, any scientist or scientists like Mark um, and say, you know, what's the study that shows this? Oftentimes the answer is it's not one study, it's a whole collection of studies. Um, you know, there's not one study, there's not one study that proves Einstein's theories of relativity. There's not one study that proves the quantum theory of anything. There's not one study that proves the the atomic nature of the universe. It's a but if huge collection of studies, data. Steve, if there's multiple studies, how how do people decide if something's valid? Like you know, like even with the other That's side, what a meta analysis, was, was side. right? Think about that. A meta analysis yeah. is when you're looking at right lots of studies and you draw conclusions 
based on the best evidence you have at the moment, right. you know, but the other, I, yeah, the other thing ahead. you do is there, there's this sort of pyramid of expertise or there's a chain of expertise from people like Mark down through people like um, uh, Hugh Katz and Joe Torgerson and, uh, you know, other researchers like that who are a little closer to the classroom on from them towards people who are getting increasingly close to the practice of teaching kids to read, like David and Louisa, on into other people who we learn to trust. And you have to figure out, you have to look at that sort of chain, that intellectual chain of knowledge and expertise, and you have to start to figure out who do I trust, who can I trust, who do other people trust? Because you can't, you know, I can't read all this stuff for myself. You you can't do that. Um, you have to have a critical eye. You have to you you have to choose carefully who you trust. You have to look for other people you trust who back that up. And then when you got, come to a thing where Mark is disagreeing with David, who's disagreeing with somebody else, um, you know Susan Brady disagreed with D David. And the interesting thing was people were people interpreted that as saying, well, Mark and Susan are over here saying one thing, and David is over here saying something else. What should I believe? Actually, Mark and Susan, if you paid close attention, were also disagreeing with you, each other fiercely about some things, but that wasn't the focus of it. That wasn't the focus of that dispute. So people missed that. They actually disagree. They 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 all three have very different positions about advanced phonemic awareness. It could all come on the literacy view at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Oh my you know, God. And you know, people will lose their minds. You know, I mean, <laughs> but it's this is this is the reality of how this works. And I come back to the religious kind of metaphor again. If if you want to go to if you want to go to your neighborhood Protestant church and you want to ask the question, what does God expect from me? And you want a nice, clean, clear answer that somebody says, this is it. There's nothing more. It's this. It's this for all eternity. It will never be anything else. You go to one kind of a church and you have a certain experience. If you want to have. If you're inter if you feel good about somebody who says, well, that's a really interesting question. Let's roll that around for the next 30 years of our life. You know, you go to a different church or a different class within the same church. Um, and you have to know that about yourself. But at the end of the day, you still have to raise children. At the end of the day, you still have to teach children right from wrong. At the end of the day, you still have to live your life the best that you can. Um, and I think it's the same way here. At the end of the day, whether you believe, whether you are focused on all the answers we don't have, or whether you're focused on the answers we do have, and you say, this is all I need, I'll never need more than this, whatever whatever you do, at the end of the day, you still have to teach children how to read, and you have to do the best you can with an imperfect um, yeah, so what about body of knowledge. This um, part of the slide, one of the slides that said, um, relying on authorities is not a good plan. Who was he referring to? I have no case? idea. Because I kind of just said relying on authorities is a good plan. Um, I kind of said that. And depending on when you're, depending on, you know, here's what this is like. So you should ask the person, you should go to the prom with the best looking date you can get. You should go to the prom with the best looking date. It'll say yes to you. And while you're at the prom, if you can get somebody better, you should dump the last one and go with the new one. You know, that that's the brutality of this. Um, that that really is true. Um, you know, we we have to do this. You know, we have to do it. We we have to do it. You know, they like I said before, when they flew the space shuttle for all those years. The first time they flew the space shuttle, it was already two or three generations of technology obsolete. But that's the space shuttle we got. So this is what we're flying. And we're going to put people in space and we're going to do things with the space shuttle. And, you know, mm -hmm. eventually, oh, I, eventually I, the I, flaws in the space shuttle killed some people and we stopped flying it. But Yeah, I mean, I looked at that and I'm thinking, well, you know, is he talking about self-proclaimed experts? Is that yeah, I don't know. He's referring to i, I mean, think that would be really interesting that's one of the things i would ask mark and, and i would say wait a minute i'm i'm not sure that works because if you think that schools and groups of teachers in schools maybe groups of teachers led by a literacy coach or a reading specialist are going to flesh this literature out for themselves and they're going to go back and they're going to scour the research that's not going to happen you yeah. know they don't have the time they don't have the access they don't have the background you know they're going to read something and you know 
people ask me all the time, how do you read these studies so fast? I don't read them first page to last page. I start by reading the abstract, then I go to the methodology, I look at the results, I look at the design of the study. Oh, and so I know from the, the, the design and the statistics they use, I understand the limits of the study and how far you can go with it before I read what they tell me. Because what people do is they read and the study says this and this and this and this and this. And by the time they get to the part that tells them, wait a minute, I need to be more cautious than that. They've already sort of bought the farm. You know, they, 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 they've decided, wow, this is great. I'm going to really, I'm going to start doing this on Monday. And then they get to the methodology and they found out there were only six kids in the study and their definition of proficient reading was kind of all over the place. And, you know, it's sort of like when people, and, you know, Mark was guilty of this. Some other people were guilty of this. They cited during the great debate, the great um, upheaval that occurred between some people and, you know, people like Hegarty and, Ki and Kilpatrick. There was this question, of, should we be teaching phonemic awareness using letters instead of non-letter tokens? And there was this great upheaval and people cited the National Reading Panel. The NRP said, the NRP said, read the whole damn thing. The NRP says about those findings, be very careful interpreting these because none of these studies were set up to answer this question. And all of this data is confounded by lots of intervening, what they call moderator variables. Um, you know, I did some analysis for David and some other people going through those. The studies that they listed as teaching phonemic awareness using letter letters and not just non-letter tokens, over half of them started by te teaching kids with non-letter tokens and then moved to letters faster than other people did. But they didn't just exclusively teach with letters right from the beginning. So that was important to know. And it just turns out by happenstance that the studies that used letters also happened to teach 50 or 60% longer than the people who use non-letters. So did they do better because we use letters? Did they do better because they just got more instruction? You know, because those studies weren't set up to answer that question. Now, there are other studies since then, since the National Reading Panel in, came out in 2000, there are studies since then that do lead us genuinely to understand that even if we're not going to teach phonemic awareness exclusively with letters instead of non-letter tokens, we can almost certainly get to that point earlier than we thought we could. We can right. go to that faster than we thought we could. We can start with that, but be ready to move back for the kids who need it, or we can move to those letters much faster than we thought we should. That raises another point. And I want teachers to understand this. And if you are teachers or interpret research for teachers, I want this point is very, very important. Studies were designed about teaching a phonemic awareness or phonics or fluency or vocabulary or whatever that isolated the teaching of those things so that they can control that variable very carefully. You don't want to do a study where you're in right off the bat where you're teaching phonemic awareness and phonics hand in hand, because how do you know which one contributed to the results? I want to pull it out. I want to isolate it. I want to disconnect it from everything else to see, does teaching this matter? People have interpreted that to mean that when I teach phonemic awareness, I should teach it isolated from everything else. No, we had to do that when we designed the study. We had to do that when we designed the study so we could see the impact of the phonemic awareness very separate from the impact of everything we did. That doesn't mean that when you teach that you have to do it that way. At a conference recently, I stood in front of the room and I said, 10, 15 years from now, it's going to be much more common. And I think it'll turn out to be a good thing that you could walk into a classroom and if you closed your eyes and listened for 10 minutes, you might wonder, is this the phonics part of the lesson? Is this the phonemic awareness part of the lesson? Is this the morphology part of the lesson? Because I'm kind of getting all of those at one time. And I said, I think that would be a good thing. Somebody who's been in this fight a lot longer than me and has very definitely earned their stripes looked at me from the audience like I had made them eat a turd. I mean, they they were so bothered by that that I thought they were going to come at me. And I understand where that comes from, but I stand by what I said. I think we're going to find out that teaching those things hand in hand, where we're shifting fluidly, because that's what you do when you read anyway. You not you don't say, let me go through this for the phonics part. Okay, now I'm going to go through the phonemic. You know, that's not how we comprehend things. Now, Teachers should know how to do that, how to teach those things very separately from each other for the kids who are struggling where you do some more analysis and you realize 
this kid is this kid's got the phonics down, but they don't have the phonology down, and they're trying to bootstrap the the phonics to make up for their lack of phonology. I need to isolate that phonology and make them deal with it, force them to deal with it, not find an end run around it. I'm going to make them do it. Um, I think you need to know how to do that, but that doesn't mean that's the best way for most kids right from the start. That's such a great point. You know, I think a lot of times, um, you know, why didn't you press the I should. I know this whole episode is one big. Woo! Cheers. <laughs> um, I have to say, you know, I'm listening to you, and sometimes teachers do the same thing in small group that they do for the whole class. They're just kind of bringing them into a smaller group but doing the same right. thing. And I'm like, no, the idea is to look at the skill deficits and in small group, if you get that chance, you should be isolating and working yes. on certain things that they need if that's in right. fact right. what they need. Right. Judy, did I forget anything in this discussion that you would like to ask? Oh, or I think you hit everything, but also like when we're looking at kids, let's also look at the skills that they have mastered to help yes. them move forward as well. And that's about it. This has been an amazing discussion. I can't wait to see uh, what our listeners think. Yeah. yeah. I can't wait to see uh, what Mark has to say, he offered a voiceover to the people that are asking him on uh, Twitter. So let's see what happens next. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that I'm the, that I understand every. Let me say something else about Mike Seidenberg and, and scientists at that level of what's going on. You know, and and there are a number of them out there. Um, it doesn't mean they get everything right. It doesn't mean we can't disagree with them. It doesn't mean that they aren't don't have the same responsibility the rest of us have to modify their beliefs over time as more information becomes available. And if you disagree with Mark, I have no problem with that. And I don't think he has a problem with it too, either. But let me say this about Mark Seidenberg and these other researchers. These are very serious men and women. If you disagree with them, you need to stop for a moment and ask, why do I disagree with them? What do I really believe? What do I know? Why do I disagree with them? Because they deserve to be taken that seriously. You can't just brush them aside. These are not people we brush aside. Ken Goodman is somebody we brush aside. Um, you know, and, and Stephen Krashen and those sorts of folks, you know, I've, you want to brush Richard Allington aside, I'll pick a broom and do it with you. Um, you know, I have no, these are not, these are not serious scientists. These are not serious people. Mark is a very, very, very serious scientist. Doesn't mean he's got everything right. Doesn't mean his best guess about what the unknowns will, will turn out to be is better than mine or better than anybody else's. But if Mark says, hey, this is right or this is wrong, I would pause for a moment and take that very seriously before I jumped up and said, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that was a very good point. And I, I do think just, you know, putting on my teacher hat I understood why teachers were getting angry. I understood why parents were getting angry. They don't want to derail the mission. You right. know, the, the, the bottom line is they've worked so hard to get to this point that, you know, I think they feel that, I think the way you said it, it was a little clumsy and um, it, it comes off as almost ammunition yeah. It, you know, it, it's being misinterpreted and it comes off as ammunition for the balanced literacy proponents. Even if that wasn't the intention, I think it um, it can have that effect. And I, I see that parents and teachers were quite upset with this. Yeah. And and I understand the idea that, you know, we're, we're winning some really important battles. Can't we just stop and celebrate that for a while? Can't we just kind of exactly. lay on the beach of victory and and get a tan? You know, can't we just do that? <laughs> do we have to start? Do we have to start hacking ourselves into little pieces already? Um, and I have no problem with people taking a hiatus and say, "Look, we're going to teach what we believe now." I understand there's going to be something better. There already is something better, but we're going to finish the trip we're on now before we start planning our next trip. I have no problem with that. Um, but I, I don't want people to think, to be misled into thinking 
this science of model, the science of reading that we have now, this is everything we will ever need. This is every answer we're ever going to need. It'll never change. Um, I think the likelihood, I think there's some things that we know that are almost guaranteed to remain very much at the core of what we do. Phonics matters. Phonemic awareness matters. Learning these things matters. Vocabulary matters. Oral language before you get to school and after you start school is vitally important. That the interconnection between reading and writing, between spelling and reading and writing is vital and we need to emphasize it and coordinate those things as well as we can. I think all of that is bullseye science that is going to be unwavering. And it's still going to be there 100 or 200 years from now. I think everything else is up for grabs. Yeah. And I think there's yeah. things that are better than that. But the biggest thing you have to do is don't do the things we know are wrong. Right. Don't right. do that stuff. Because that's what worries me about the balanced literacy people. They stand there and say, well, they don't have all the answers either. So until they get all the answers, do whatever you want. Right. Right. Exactly. And, you know, and, and that's what gets me also. You know, if you know that something is harmful or at least it's it's something that we know could lead kids in the wrong direction, right. Right. don't do it. Okay. Yeah, it's it's like somebody comes to a nutritionist and says, what's the best source of protein I can eat? This lean white meat of chicken or this fish? And the, and the nutritionist says, well, I don't know. That's a hard question. He says, well, you're answering it. I'm going to be out in the car eating a bag of marshmallows. Not that. You don't get to do that. You, you, you can pick the fish. You can pick the chicken. You can pick the lean beef. You can pick the vegetable protein, but you can't go eat marshmallows. That is such a great analogy. Oh my goodness. On, on that note, I think we should end because that is so perfect. How true, like make smart choices. And there are, we know there are bad choices, right? right. So let's not go there. Right. Judy, any last thoughts before we wrap? Last thought, when I see nonsense like this online from other folks, SOR folks already laying the groundwork for SOR not working, give it up. We're going to get it right <laughs> this time. We're going to do well. Thank you, Steve, for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Faith. You just got off an airplane. Here you are. You are amazing. Um, and that's it. So follow us on Facebook, Real Teachers Letting Loose, the, the Literacy View, Real Teachers Letting Loose. Follow us on Instagram, the Literacy View. Follow Faith on Instagram at High Five Literacy. Follow me on Instagram at Boxner Damsky. Follow Faith on X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, at High Five Literacy. Follow me at Boxner Damsky. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Literacy View. Follow us on Spotify, all the podcast places, Apple Podcasts. Write us a good review and keep sharing us with your friends, teachers, researchers. Yes. Sharing um, is so important. Yeah, it's, it's making a big difference. A lot of we, we're gaining a lot of new listeners, a lot of new voices, and we are having a damn good time. Dr. Steve Dykstra, thank you so much. Um, we appreciate you and you, you say it better than anybody else. It was great. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Okay. Thank you.